Welcome everyone. Um, thank you, Helena Kopuni Reynolds, for starting us off with the um, Oli Berlina about um, Mano. And um, my name is Noel Kahanu. I'm part of the planning team of Weaving a Network of Care for Oceanic Collections, which is a project that is funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and brought to you in partnership with the East West um, Center, specifically their arts program, and the American Studies Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, as part of this month-long cohort of uh, 17 people that have come from 13 island communities all throughout Hawaii and the Pacific, um, we have the opportunity to bring in two uh, special instructors. One was here earlier this month, uh, Sean Mallon from the Tupapu Museum, and um, and we also now have Rami Tikanawa. And we have the added bonus <laughs> of having her sister, uh, Kahuto Tikanawa, also. So as a, as a consequence, thus was born Sister Act. <laughs> I asked uh, Ronnie, what should we call your talk? She said, I don't know, Sister Act. Right. So, um, yeah, it's such an honor um, and, and what an opportunity to bring these two incredible women here to Hawaii. Um, Kahutoi has been here several times, but for, um, for Ronnie, this is her first trip to Hawaii which makes it um, even more special. Now, uh, I do want to say that, um, and, and acknowledgments to Eric Chang, who is manning our uh, live feed through Facebook. So, you know, due to COVID, we have restrictions on sort of how many people could be present here, but we are hoping that there are many many more out there in virtual land um, that is beaming in to join us for this presentation. So um, both Rangi Tekanawa and Kahutoi Tekanawa descend from a famous line of Maori weavers. Um, this lineage includes their mother, uh, Digerus Tekanawa, and their grandmother, Rangi Mari, uh, Rangi Mari uh, their intimate knowledge of the material world, of plants and mud and water, feathers and fibers, have helped forge their careers as practitioners, as educators, as leaders. Uh, Rangi has a career that spans over 30 years as the first ever Maori textile conservator. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Conservation from the Canberra University. 
an ambassador of science from Victoria, from Victoria University of Wellington. She most recently received her PhD from Victoria, where she traced how Maori dyes can reveal a Tonga's geographical origins, thus reconnecting them to their communities. Um, Kamakoi is um, has her undergraduate degree from Auckland University. Um, and she has a Master's of Art at the Auckland uh, University of Technology. And she is getting her PhD. In fact, I heard she turned it in. <laughs> turned it in um, from my class. <laughs> and um, she actually is um, one, of, one, of her, <laughs> one of her members of her committee is here. Is that? Yes. Um, so um, what is, you know, I think fascinating and the opportunity, because one of the things is that, um, and I should say this, that actually currently Kahutoi is the Poarahi po uh, curator at Auckland War Memorial Museum. And so one of the things that, um, that happened was that they were talking story and saw so many um, commonalities in their studies uh, in terms of their PhD research. Um, and I'll let them share more about that, but the, but that in essence sort of um, they come at it from slightly different directions but are sort of arriving at the same place. And just it's so they've never presented together before. Um, and so I'm, we're just, what an honor to have you both here. It means so much to, um, to learn from, from all your, um, to just be present in the sharing um, of your histories and your families and your legacies. So welcome. Um, I feel very privileged to be here. Thank you very much, Noel, for the invitation. Uh, to be here uh, on the land uh, from where our tūpuna should uh, set out into the wider Māori outdoor. The sea that joins us all together. So, Namihi Nui Kia Thank you very much for the invitation and the word from it's my privilege to be here. I must say, to be here. Thank you so to be in Hawaii. Uh, as we came through, and I wanted to see that ocean. I wanted to just, just imagine what it would have been like for our two people to have uh, been of the mind that they could travel uh, the wide sea, um, you know, creating humans kinds of the greatest feat. And uh, through that, um, it pronounces whakapapa, I believe, and the connectivity of us all. And indeed, for sister and I here today, that it's doing the sister act, that is exactly <laughs> what it's about. Uh, there will be no great sort of uh, uh, presentation of songs or backing vocals or anything like that. But our voices, um, we speak from our heart, from something deep inside us. Is Papa. And like Noel said, you know, that that we came to a realization that uh, our our studies, our researches were aligned. Uh, I approach it from a conservation perspective and Kabu from a uh, practitioner's uh, perspective, sort of enhancing the market. So uh, my my real title is Heakuringa. Otato Tupuna from the hands of our Tupuna. And um, uh, as Noel said, we were uh, had childhood tuition in uh, traditional Maori weaving. We would often smell the boiling of flax. Uh, we would 
have to contend with vacuum cleaning up all the fibres that were on that stuck to the carpet. We have been bald and even be a uh, bit of that. So whilst it didn't sort of captivate me as a child early, it's, it's ironic that uh, as I sort of entered into the beginning of my senior years, about 30 it was, that I was given the opportunity to go further with that. And that was because of the great Tamari exhibition which happened in 1984. Oh, sort of mid-80s. Mid and um, the Tamari exhibition was curated by a Carol Obisa from the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Anyway, she gathered the Taonga and took it abroad and it got huge recognition there. And as a result of that, there was a, an awareness in our museums and galleries that we needed Māori uh, working in museums uh, to care for our own Taonga. And so because I had this lineage of, of weavers, my mother was shoulder tapped, so to speak, by my dear auntie to um, find somebody to go and learn about conservation of harakeke. And I just happened to get out of bed at the right time while mum was on the uh, phone to my dear auntie. I'm looking for this person. Who could it be that they could go off and uh, learn about conservation? And this was in 1986. So mum caught me in the corner of her eye and um, she finished the phone call and then she she sat me down beside my dear grandmother at the time we were in the kitchen and she said look they're looking for someone to go and uh, learn about conservation and i said uh, of harakeke and uh, I, I would say what is that uh, is that like you know working for the department of conservation looking after harakeke in its natural environment uh, and we all that, thought that would be the case but how is that related to the museums because i can be quite honest with you i didn't go to school to learn how to be a Conservator, no one ever talked about conservation. In fact, today a lot of my family and extended friends haven't got a clue what conservation is about. Anyway, as it was, um, I soon um, spoke with the right people and it was of great interest to go away and learn about conservation. So in 1986, I um, took the opportunity to do an introductory course in the conservation of basketry at the then Canberra College of Advanced Education in Canberra. Australia. And uh, I met um, my uh, late uh, colleague uh, Valerie Carson, who was a textile specialist there at the National Museum. The country didn't have a conservator at that point in time, a textile conservator. Um, and uh, we got to know each other just in three weeks, and she believed I had the skills, and I'm very grateful for her for recognising that. And I'm also, uh, you know, whilst I, I say that as a child, I was exposed to traditional Māori weaving, my mother was also instrumental in teaching us how to sew. And it's something I must say, if, now that I've got the podium, is that a lot of young girls don't know how to sew these days, um, to thread a needle, make a mend. But that was something that was always in front of us uh, as a child, as a young lady. So that was, a supported my role as a textile um, person and I love and I like uh, yeah, sewing and stitching and uh, we're our nickname for our uh, sisters because uh, I've got four other sisters is that we've been nicknamed the uh, Tia Kardashians because we <laughs> like to go to fashion shows and I do have another sister that actually is instrumental in, in promoting fashion design so we have this Tia Kardashian label um, but it's all about textiles and it's all about the mum and, uh, and, and Nana encouraging me or us to be involved in textiles. And so it is, this is a lot longer than I thought it would be, um, that I got introduced to conservation. I went away, found out what it was like, and I absolutely loved it. I loved having a tutu with things. I loved to see how elements were woven. And um, because of the background with weaving, I sort of had a fairly good idea how things were going and what, how the, what the material composition was and what the process of the materials were. So I entered into conservation and I went into the museum and, um, you know, a kaitaka pai pai law would be put in front of me and said, right, this is your responsibility. You now, now have to stabilise it. And that was truly an honour, I can tell you. I would often be brought to tears when looking at it and um, 
realising the craftsmanship and also that uh, there was a huge disconnection between the Taonga and the people. I knew well that many Māori uh, had no idea um, the craftsmanship or the mātauranga within those kākahu. And um, I felt then that I had an ethical obligation to try and close that gap, try and make a reconnection between Taonga kākahu and Tangata Whenua, which is basically the title of my PhD. So I want to share with you some of these treasures. And I concentrate mainly on uh, pre-European and contact Taonga because they are a testament, uh, without any European influence, of uh, the intellect of our tūhuna. So, um, and the other sad thing about these these examples of uh, pre-European and contact uh, period kākahu is that the majority of them are offshore. So the one at the top left is a mahiti. It's a cloak that is the kōpapa, the foundation, is very closely woven together. And it's adorned or with tufts of the kuri fur. And the kuri um, is the dog, the Polynesian dog. And that is a testament also of our tūpuna's great feats because they actually took the Polynesian dog from Hawaii, Tahiti, all the way across the ocean. I'm not quite sure how they would have kept the dog, but uh, on the waka, and it, it would arrive at them at Aotearoa. So anything, any tonga that has uh, the kuri fur is, is a, a huge testament of our uh, tūpuna knowledge. Um, and that is that kākahus with this nice deep tānapō border. I actually haven't seen it. I've only seen pictures of it, and I urban aros it all the time. Um, it's it's uh, got the dyed black fibre in it, and I'll talk a bit more about that. But the one on the right top is a kahukuri. Um, now, both the kahukuri and the mahiti, because they have the dog fur in it, uh, they uh, symbolise someone, the wearer to be of, of status, or rangatira. And uh, during European contact, our, our Europeans uh, would um, know that the person that they needed to talk to, the leader, would be the one that would be wearing the kahukuri or the mahiti. So they had status. Um, the the kahukuri is completely covered with the dog fur, so his huge... The one uh, in the lower left corner is a kaitaka pai pairoa. And this is, you know, for understanding what the weave is, in, and it's called twining, and I must say, I forgot to mention, twining is the oldest weaving technique known to mankind, and I'm happy to stand by that. Uh, it's always the, the thread techno technology is also the oldest technology known to mankind. It's not applying, or it's not a spinning of fibres together, rather it's a splicing of fibre, fibres. So the twining, as well as the thread technology, is very, very old. And it's so interesting that it features, or is employed in the makeup of these kākahu. So this is a kaitaka pai pai door, and the pai pai door, because it has the weft rows, doesn't sound right, but the weft rows go from top to bottom. That's because when it's constructed, it's actually constructed from side to side. And it's then tuned up. I can explain later if anybody's <laughs> not understanding. Um, but the uh, deep tarpaul borders are incredible. Uh, we're talking weave counts of one stitch per millimetre. And um, the uh, number of uh, vertical rows uh, hundreds, and uh, the approximate width of this kaitaka pai pai door is about two and a half metres by about two metres deep. So really quite large, and we want, to, if we're trying to imagine what it would, how they were worn, it's a number of wrappings around the body. And I wondered sometimes if they could wrap somebody else within that as well. And uh, I don't mean that's a that is a frivolous statement, but rather, you know, when you're huddled and when you're cold, you, you can wrap up. Even with children, you can wrap them in as well. So, 
Um, and then the, the one on the lower corner is a quarter wide. So the quarter wide, this is more sort of uh, belonging to the common or more common folk, uh, completely adorned with the black thrums, and I'm going to talk more about that. But these are a wonderful testament of uh, Mata Rana Māori. Um, and can I ask, are those all harakeke? Yes, sorry, I should have said that. It's all, all woven from how people. Sorry about this. This is not a very, I think I've, uh, 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 well, the next slide is better. Uh, but this is anyway, overall, a very simple looking um, cloak and sometimes referred to by early European as a mat, uh, uh, but closely woven um, and a black, black border. The uh, in Durham, uh, at the Oriental Durham. Uh, museum, university museum, and so my colleague uh, appointed me to this. And uh, in my in 2017, I had the opportunity to go and, and visit. Sorry about the quality of slide. This one's a bit better. Okay, so it's about uh, 1790, and you can see the tag up there: New Zealand cloak, uh, D. D. Sir C. Monk. Uh, BR, I'm not quite sure what that refers to. That's the label that's attached to it. Um, so C. Monk uh, was a collector of, of a number of early cloaks. And he had a collection, and I think that was passed on to Lord Sandwich. And then that came to the hands of the Trevelyan family, who then deposited within the, the Durham Museum. Uh, but from a technical point of view, when I saw this, um, and I only had two hours with it, it is forever with me. It's on my phone, I look at it, and I know that I have never ever seen anything like this, and I don't believe that there's anything like this in Aotearoa. So, you know, again, uh, our, those that are intimately associated with these kākau who have no idea that they exist. So I... Um, I want to extrapolate as much as I can about the Mātauranga from a weaver's perspective, but from a conservation point of view, the serious issue with this is the deterioration of the dyed black fibre. Ever since I've been in conservation, um, there's many examples of the black dye just perishing, and that's because of the nature of the black dye is very acidic. And, and so I would spend a good part of my time uh, studying or working with science, because this is what it is, it's a material science study, uh, to understand what is the causing or the mechanism of degradation in the dyed black fibre. Um, so I've highlighted just details of what the weaving is to show this is what I've got to try and capture or uh, mimic before all of the black fibers actually perish. As you can see, it's already happening here. Um, and so that, I, so that we can take that technology. And, and I also have to appreciate that it's on the other side of the planet as well. Um, so this is very, very special to me, this kākohu, and I, and I do plan to get back there and stabilize it. So with uh, finding the best means of uh, conserving and preserving the mātauranga, uh, we've looked at samples of uh, taonga that possess the dyed black fibre. And my science supervisor at the time, who uh, supervised my uh, Masters in Science at Victoria, <coughs> would be with me in examining here the kaitaka, um, and, and it's got all black fenu. And you can see that it's perished and it's just left the undyed uh, weft lines. So it's really quite a serious matter because it just it just perishes. Now, some of you may have seen examples of the perishing of the of the iron tannate dyed fiber. Um, so so the process of dyeing black for fiber is that it's first treated with a tannin and then it's submerged into an iron rich mud. And the tannin and the iron complex, and that becomes very acidic. When it's exposed to oxygen, it actually uh, increases the rate of deterioration. So that's thus the science. So based on that knowledge that we had, we then engineered a novel consolidation treatment using sodium alginate. 
So I worked with a chemist as well as Gerald there and um, provided uh, samples, dyed black samples, uh, dyed in our local uh, uh, using Hino uh, bark and our local mud. And um, my dear cousin actually provided her pupu as a, a slightly sacrificial tama to test uh, the um, consolidation. She passed that on to me and she said, look, I understand that you're in this business. Can you fix this up, please? So I, I um, gratefully received it and we applied the sodium alginate uh, to the fibres that had been, or the lengths, poor kinikini, that had been lost, as you can see on the far left. And uh, it's a pretty tricky sort of a treatment. It's sort of a once-only approach. Um, I did dye up some mocha and threaded it through the center of the cylindrical lengths and then consolidated uh, the fragile fibers to the more uh, robust uh, supporting fiber that I threaded through the middle and then reattached all those lengths to the waistband of the pubu. So it makes a reasonable before and after. And for uh, the cousin, she says that during Christmas they would pull this pew pew out and just to celebrate their, or just to look at it and celebrate their, their father. It belonged to their father. And I treated that in 2013 and went and examined it in 2016 and found that it, after three years it was still retaining uh, its form. So the criteria for consolidation was to um, induce strength, so bind the fibres together, and then to maintain the colour. But inducing strength was the, the main criteria. So uh, that's sort of the science around the consolidation, and there are other consolidation treatments that have happened. Otago University have put out another consolidation treatment. So there's still a lot of research to be done. So whilst that's happening, I've got to try and capture that Mato Dunga before it all perishes. Um, the, uh, further in the analysis of um, understanding of the chemistry of the dyed black fibre, we've used this uh, portable XRF X-ray fluorescence elemental analysis. And so it's a papa when I was working and uh, I, I realised that there was a draw of provenance uh, pupu. So the pupu that I showed in the previous slide, the waste garment, five of them have showed where they came from. And so we applied the XRF to see what sort of composition of elements there were in there. Now the XRF did exactly that, and I'm very pleased to say that Tikawiti, where I come from, has a very high concentration of iron. Mm -hmm. um, but it only gives you quantity, it doesn't actually give you quality. It doesn't give you quality as far as, uh, is it a magnetite, a hematite, or girthite? Uh, because all of those are relative to how they react to the oxygen. Uh, some have a red oxide, some have a, a yellow brown oxide. Um, so, whilst that is good information, what we needed to know next was um, yeah, the type of iron. And that required quite a, a very sort of sophisticated analysis that wasn't available to me at the time. So we took another directive, this is all in the course of the PhD, and, and that was to measure the colour of the blacks that I would dye up. Um, so, um, just to throw your eye over dyed fibres, as we know. So the, the black dye, as I said before, is uh, treated first where we come from, with a hino, and then into an iron-rich mud, and we get this lovely black. I call it a blue-black. So my black is blue-black. Um, and then... Um, uh, then we have the natural, of course, and then what we call a direct dye is the uh, caprosma or low deco, and that's a dye that doesn't need any water tin or tannin. It's, you just put the fibre immediately into. That's, that's sort of not quite, but I'm, I'm just including it because it is one of those dyes that are often seen in Māori textiles. 
But I'm very happy with this brown here. So this brown, um, I've gone a bit crazy about uh, the browns lately. I call it a rufous brown. Um, so it's with the tannin treatment for this is tarnikaha. And um, unbeknown to me, I, I um, well, all I knew from my time with working with Mama Nana was that to get the brown, you had to pre-treat the hookah with tarnikaha and then put it into a wood ash. But for the PhD, I put the tarnikaha into mud and into the iron-rich mud, and this is the colour I got. And I was delighted with it because this is the colour that I see on a lot of the early kākahu. Um, so it's just another process. So I'm just sort of putting that up there to say this is what our colours look like, uh, particularly the brown and the black of our in our early kākahu. So, the, and the direction for the project was to identify dyeing processes, different muds and different tannins. And so, tannin, uh, well, first of all, harakeke, to uh, harvest the harakeke, extract the mocha, and then to um, uh, treat it with uh, hino. So, in keeping with uh, customary practices and under the guidance of uh, SISDA, uh, we would go and gather um, some hino and take it off. It looks a bit brutal uh, to cut it away from the trunk and then paste it uh, sort of like a, a, a traditional band-aid, paste it with mud. And I'm very pleased to report that when I've gone back there later, that, that it has actually has a, does have a healing. It sort of sort of uh, allows it to grow inward, the, the bark that remains there. So gathering the bark and then steeping the bark into water and letting it boil and leaving it overnight. And then, then you would put your mocha into it. And the next thing would be to go and uh, source the paru. So for the project, there were seven tannins selected and I gathered paru samples from around the North Island at six locations and one in the South Island. So basically, I had a sort of geographical spread of um, paru. Um, so, uh, when we, I'm sorry if I'm jumping around a bit, but I, in the research work that I did, masters, we identified that there are two different types of tannins. There's a gallo tannin and a condensed tannin. And um, this is liquid absorbance reflectance, reflectance uh, graphs. And uh, basically, the gallo tannins have a sort of a blue hue to it, of which he knows, uh, which is why I had this sort of the blue black tinge in, in the putty that we dye, uh, fibers that we dye. And then the condensed tannins are typical of um, the Manuka Kanuka tannins. So in the tannin world, which is really complex, uh, it's quite sophisticated, we've identified these two main groups. Just like in the plant world, we have two main groups. We have the monocotyledons and the dicotyledons. In the tannin world, we have the condensed and the galatannins. And that's all relative to colours. So back to the gathering of the paru, we've gone around the North Island, northeast, southwest, pretty much. I'm on the west, uh, that's our paru site there, the family paru site. This is where mum and nana would um, go to dye their, their, their muka or their pupil or whatever. Um, there have been changes, and I'm totally mindful too, that on this quest to go and gather paru, that uh, there's been lots of compromises through agriculture, uh, through de the dairy industry and sheep and cattle, and, and in our case, lots of goats that were... Uh, coming through the bush. So, um, yeah, I just had to take consider all those things. But overall, um, the gathering of the putty was what I call success, successful. Up north, way up north in Ahipara, to the east in Whakatane, uh on the east coast of Rotoria, um, Masterton, um, South North Island, and then at the top of the South Island. So I felt that I had a, a very, you know, a reasonable representation of different mud samples. Um, and the nine tannin samples I had were Hino, Manuka Kanuka, Manuka 
oh, Manuka separately, Kanuka separately, Manuka and Kanuka, Tafiro, Tutu, that's maybe from down south that they use, and Tanaka. Actually, I think I'm not, I don't think I've got nine there, I've got seven, sorry, seven paru samples. And this is a, just a close up of um, that experiment of um, muka being treated with the tannin and then uh, rubbed, uh, uh, submerged into the mud, taken out of the mud, and then exposed to the sunlight. Now, my dear mother always said that, you know, when you take your uh, muka out of the paru, let it uh, expose to the sunlight for a little bit. That just the warmth from the sun actually encourages sort of uh, a complexing reaction. Um, and so this is what this is doing. So you can see that there are the variations in the, the different colour of mud. But nevertheless, the chemistry and the science that's happening to colour the fibre lack as much the same. So once uh, uh, they're exposed to the sun and having been submerged in the mud for uh, overnight or eight hours at least, um, I then washed them and then dried them, of course, and then took them into the lab and uh, cut them into little snippets and then compressed them into little discs and they were prepared like that for colour measurements. So it's all about plotting the colour. Um, and so this is a colour meter, and uh, I don't know if you can see the little squirt, the little cardboard with the green tape on the side. That's actually holding the little black disc of which the colour meter will sit directly on top of. And it gives me the colour meter gives me um, a reading or plotting of um, where the hue of black is sitting according <coughs> to this colour mapping the CIE. Uh, international colour plotting chart. Now uh, it's an LAB, so the L um, you can have values from 0 to 100. Um, if you're more black, you're closer to the 0, and a red hue is a, a slightly A value, uh, and then green, and so on. So um, this is just plotting all of this out. And uh, basically, from the plotting of those, uh, all, and there, I think it was 198 um, recordings that I did for the uh, samples, um, the ones that were significant in their colours uh, were the Tikwiri Paru, was the blackest. Um, and, it, and it showed its plotting in the L to be more of the blue position mapping and the one from the east coast uh, with a values quite the highest a values um, moving towards the red so whilst it's ever so slight you can use a color meter to detect a color or the hue of black within the fiber and now i think it was my eye i'm looking at black in a completely different way and i can say oh that looks like a bit of a red black or a blue black and just lately it's a brown black or it's yeah it's, it's, it's really quite exciting but you know to be equipped with a color meter could well enable you to identify perhaps uh this is suggesting the chemistry in the uh dying processes as a means of uh, connecting to. So all in the practices of um, dyeing, of uh, working with your, your barks, uh, identifying your paru sources, that's all connectivity. Some cases you cannot get physically connected to the tonga because they're not really in front of you. But if you were learned of the practices, then you are connecting. You will be walking. I have walked a number of paths with those people that have taken me to their paru sites. I've been so privileged to have that honour and for them to give to me their paru, their ancestral paru. Um, so, you know, that's, that's the connection, to connect to the practice, I believe. And the science can actually support a lot of this by identifying the material composition and processes. Um, coming to the end of this, um, I, I, it's, it's been sad, this, this was one of the first paru sites that I went to and I was so excited, I thought, oh, this is a good sign. 
the first party site that I go to, and it's got a monument there to say, this is recognising a party site. This is in Whakatane. Mm -hmm. And even a poem that was put up, directed to signify that this is a traditional, uh, historical, significant, cultural site. However, unfortunately, when taking the party from here, it tested that they were not, it was not rich in iron source. So it cannot be used or well, doesn't have the properties to dye black the fibre because it's been compromised by council activities surrounding this paru site and they've made paths and uh, put in trees. So they've restructured the landform and as a result, there's new water flow that come into it and, and we've lost it. So it's quite a, um, uh, a sad case. Um, so when we have our party sites that have been compromised, um, the other thing is to look back at our tāonga and see what amatauranga we can draw from it. So in my PhD, I've attempted to uh, weave it to know it, and I can tell you I was very challenged by it. So a rapaki, a circa 1800 store at Tapapa, and uh, this is the wow uh, tāonga. When we come into this, we look at it, we've uh, parted the poor, very, very thin poor kinikini that hang down from the waistband. It's got a black uh, kaupapa or foundation. And, you know, the elements uh, seen here uh, are very, very thin. And, you know, there are thousands of them. So we've looked at it and I thought, how did they do that? So my first thing is that I thought, oh, you know, that's, I know how to make a pew. You, you turn turn the leaf over to the dull side and you make the incision and then you turn it back to the shiny side and use a muscle shell and harrow it off and yeah. like bob your uncle pretty much. But it ain't. it's not like that at all. Um, you know, you should have a wide strip and I can then make a whole lot of finer strips. So I set about doing that and that's the best I could get. Those are my efforts to the right. <laughs> They, 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 they look the same colour, I think. But uh, quite a trial because to actually make the incision on the underside, it it, uh, it was about how much pressure you put down on the cut because you would actually you could actually cut it away. And then when you put the when you turned it to the top side to put the straight edge to make that uh, scrape away the green matter, uh, it would run off because that it was too close. So the, if you can see that the original lengths there, and I didn't pluck those off, by the way, they had fallen off. Um, I've, I've used, just to show you the gauge, uh, these are what, that's a one centimetre measurement there, that they're extremely fine. They're, they're so very fine. And to, to cut on the reverse side, um, two cuts close together without having your muscle shell edge run off, was an absolute trial and it took me ages to produce that and so you know I, I sort of hands down <laughs> you won I, I, I couldn't do it so that's the best I could do so what technology is in, in that I think we have to get all of our weavers together and, and try and do uh, what we'll see if we can mimic that so the other one this piece here and that's a real close-up because I I couldn't do, I tried to replicate this up here. Um, I think I may have succeeded in dying. Um, there's some red brown in the top trim there, like I've done here. This is actually black and then the brown, um, but they're both dyed with mud. And of course, this is my blue black. Um, and then the weaving uh, technique is um, I've woven two fenu together. Um, and I've also woven the weft from bottom to top. So usually we, the twining stitch is from one side over and to the other. Uh, but in this case, this is actually going above it and then crossing over through the back and then so on. So to the weavers uh, and to all those weavers that are with us today, uh, this is a cool challenge. Uh, there's, there's many more to do. Uh, that's only a segment of it. Um, there's much more in that kaitaka, uh, sorry, in that uh, haku at Durham that I need to get back to and investigate further. 
Um, the quarter Y, it's my second to last slide, um, is, is, uh, here's some detail of a quarter Y. This quarter Y is housed at Te Papa. I, I would be, I'd love to uh, conserve it. Thousands of thrums that are on this, that are twisted. An Z twist is the typical twist of a thrum. Um, here's my attempts here. They're not too bad. But what I learned from it is that the downward pressure on keeping that twist has to be constant. And uh, to uh, get a constant twist down a length, like the length of the hooker, hooker hooker, takes quite a bit of precision in holding it, plying it, pinching it, plying it, pinching it, plying it, and you end up with a very red knee. So there's only so much that you can do. Um, but uh, when I look at threads nowadays, uh, and, and I thank the, you know, these Tāunga for bringing it to my attention, is that it's all in the twist and the rock. So that might have something to do with the sister act. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, just very quickly put this, uh, this uh, little diagram up there to show that the twist, the, the more acute the twist, like a 45 degree angle, and if I can get your eye to come down to this picture here and at the bottom there um, just by coincidence I had a hooker hooker fall on the edge of the tape measure and I can see that the 45 uh, degree angle twist is between one millimeter so for every twist is between one millimeter that's serious serious flying so, uh, and in all of the uh, traditional kākahu, the plying of the thread, the, the, the construction of the thread, is the fundamental property to the performance of the kākahu. Um, yeah. So I'm going to finish off with something I've been inspired to do. I've woven my first kākahu uh, is called Te Aki Wai, uh, Caring for the Water. I was inspired by the uh, the many kākahu that I've seen uh, in the Tānakō border, how they have uh, the, the two patterns in the front, symmetrical, but the one in the back is, is a feature of its own. Um, my second uh, kākahu, my dear friend, come on Annie, put the song for me, model it for me because she's nice and tall. Um, <laughs> and uh, I've been inspired by the chevron or oh, the tool pattern on the inside of the kahukuri, which um, which I have found uh, appears on uh, weaving on a Solomon Island spear, um, weaving in a fragment of textile excavated from a cave in Slovenia dating Bronze Age. This weave is very, very old, and it features on um, the inside of our kahukuri. So I was inspired by that and, and made this, which recently featured at the market of the opening, I'm very proud to say. So I'll, I'm going to finish off on that. I must let sister come on. Uh, I'll leave you with that. And um, I'd just like to uh, take this time to say aloha, aloha. and uh, mahalo for allowing me to be here as well. Because I, I literally just said, oh, said to my sister when we were talking, do you think I should come? Yes. <laughs> and I said, uh, yes. and I said well, well, we'll arrange something. Um, but no, thank you for allowing me to get this time. And um, like, sorry, like what you see here, 
they are building a our tata to Pahanisa. They are the working our working hands come from our and I like to acknowledge my grandmother Ravi Maria Hitters and our mother the Gurus to come on. So I'll um, try and get through this as quickly as possible. My PhD was about um, replicating a, a, an artifact, but before I knew I was going to do that, it was about my own knowing, my own knowing. And it's about our lived realities, our knowledge system that, and what emulates our practices, our sites. This, you know, you're familiar with these sites and what it feels like in the breeze, the sea, the moana, like what my sister said about connection, and listening to story, our ways of knowing and being. Yeah. So it's locating ourselves in a safe space, and when you're when you're in the space, safe space is about your ahatanga, your safety, and your love, and your aroha for each other. So through our rāranga and fatu work, we have been we have been taught that knowledge through our observation and through the practice, and just continuing to observe all the time. Yeah. To be honest, you know, my younger brother and sister, it was just us three at home at one stage. I got to a point where I thought. What is it? They could go on away on holidays. I thought, oh, I must be a doctor because I had to keep on going out and watching them and helping them and and um, you know gathering the paru, gathering the hino bark, the rodeco bark. But you think, God, I've been able to bring that to light in my own practice, and it's been part of my career. But it is about a balancing act for all of us. You know, how do we maintain this knowledge? We're, we're doing the best, as you can see, to maintain what we know and to search further beyond that while contending with our jobs, our careers, our families, and social act. There's demands all the time. And it's a, it's a real struggle. It really is. You know, with all this technology to make things faster, it doesn't actually help us anymore in terms of time. Because we have our um, people watching right now because of technology, which is a great thing. But on the other hand, there's so many people connected to each other through social media that there's too much going on. And when you come down to looking at some of the, the cordial and the story that is important to us, it is when we know it. That's why I say, go oh, where your heart feels strong and you have the will to do that. It's really important. This is where it's all started from. We had like what my sister said, it was either drying out on the line, the clothes like you'd have clothes on one side and harakika on the other side, or you'd have a, a pot of food boiling on on the, uh, the uh, stove and then you'd have a pot of harakika boiling or it was, all, it was continual, it was always there. And I actually thought that all mothers I didn't know. I thought that all mothers did weave because my grandmother and my mother, we, it was around us all the time until I went to school and found out why they used to, the school used to ask them to come in to do the Māori week. And, and they would ask them all the time. And I said to the teacher, why did you ask somebody else's mother? Why does it have to be ours? And he said, because they're the only ones that know. And that was the biggest shock. When he said that, I thought, really? Why is that? And that's when I started to become more interested. 
So here we have, you know, the rhizomes, the roots, our foundation. That's <coughs> where we're grounded. The putake, the stem that stands strong. And the row, I know we have over here the lohala. And this is how it's, you know, there, there's a relationship with our languages as well. So from the row, we make the corner, the food baskets. The kite, the kite pakairo, the whareke, and of course the muka that's for the, uh, the weaving of our kaka. There are actually over 76 varieties of harakeke. And we, we, we get to know them by their characteristics. Yeah. Paru of the whenua or wahirua. This is a whareke that was made by my grandmother, Rani Māori. And I just want to read something out. There's always some, some terminologies or metaphors that relate to weaving. This one here, whāriki here tifo aroha, whāri whiringa o te iwi, tui, 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 ko te moke, uh, ko te moka kore e mutu. Lay out the foundation of love, to bring the people together, to bind them together, so that the strands of the people will never disintegrate. Another one that comes from a particular from our area, and that's to do with the tarnical band, if that you see at the top of this pew pew here. It goes like this Na tu te mo te tarnical. With my wisdom and your support, we will reveal the story. Or, behind a good orator, the work will be done. And that's because of all the, the patterns that are embellished in these alternative patterns that tell us the story. In like my, one of my supervisors, um, the only, as a cloak is woven before the ornamental order is added, those raising children are responsible for their character of their child. And others enhance what has already been required. And this is what leads on, leads on to our matauranga, is when we start searching further than what we already know. So that was about our morning. And then we go into the, the puna. So that area was also our puna, puna oro o matauranga, the one spring of our knowledge. And as you can read here, matauranga whānau. It was very important, our whānau, our ohana, the family, on the knowledge that they shared with us, not only with our parents, but our aunties, our uncles, our grandparents, our grandmothers. We never got to meet our grandfathers, but we heard a lot of stories about them. We heard stories that went back several generations. In the natural fact, I can stand here and say we have been able to revive um, the weaving in this, in our case, over seven generations, 170 years. And, you know, and it is something to be proud of, but it's also something to keep. We absolutely cognizant of the fact that it has to continue on. So, you know, it's now we're looking out and searching for those in our fauna that has the same interests. We've got a few couple in mind that didn't know it yet, but you know, that's how it goes. So these are our familiar. Like like the oceans we this is our familiar. Way. This is the two suckling of the the flower of the hakeke. And this is just a shot over there sh extracting the muka. Um, you know, it's easy for us to stand here and say you just harvest the hakeke and you make us a, a, a um, incision on the dull side and you extract it with a muscle shell. It's easy for us to say that because we know it and we practice it all the time. But you have to have a lot of Lots takes lots of time and effort to do that. And as you can see in this photo here, um, this is our dad's cloak and our oldest one of our sister's hair cloak. Um, 
the war never ready. Um, and it, it embellishes the, the, um, the designs and our native birds that we honour because they don't die just they they fade away because in their memory are the feathers mm -hmm. and we embellish our cloaks with those feathers to honour the mum those those birds. So it's okay knowing you know having that more hill tuna and that martogama. But there's no point if it just kept to yourself. It's about the Maramatanga to show and understand, to know it and to understand it is very liberating, but more so when it's shared. We have a responsibility to share it. And it's the enlightenment of our understanding. We're only just on the tip of the iceberg while we're standing here talking. We're trying to cover a lot of areas. So we must share to strengthen the minds of our Rangatahi that they will become more, uh, you know, a place of survival, but feel safe with, with their knowledge and them because it's been taken away from them. And it's about our resilience and the excellence of that resilience. Um, which leads on to, to my next, yeah, and it is about nurturing with nature. So in part of my PhD, Ronnie talked about replicating it. So I decided to replicate the pupil. And I had to do and find out, I found out where the, the materials came from. It was from the west coast of the South Island. So then, yeah, you call it over here, ear, ear. Yeah, and you use the words, we use the, the leaf. And it's dried out, half the split dried. Um, you know, and I was very, very lucky to be on a trip, a sponsored trip by Creative New Zealand, and then all of a sudden I realised I was in a place with a kia kia that would have been gathered for the original pukoro that I'm going to show you in the next slide would have, become, would have come from. And I know that because of the cache of materials that was with the pukoro, and that's the pukoro here. Very, very fine. Um, this was the only one, when I walked into it, this is what had happened. So I'm going to sum it up like this. I walked into the Otago Museum on Otago University to go and check with my my students. I walked in, the um, curator took me through, and she. I wanted to see Kita for Kaido. So that's the pattern of kittens. I, I looked at them and I felt this pull towards this very dark spot. And um, I said, I, these are absolutely exquisite for kind of beautiful pity. I, you know, I asked if we could see a, a couple of them. I said, but there's something that's over there stored that's calling me, that I felt <coughs> was calling me. And she said, oh, there's, a, a, there's an old, um, yes, there's an old kitty, but it's a, um, a rag. And I said, oh, okay, would you mind me looking at it? Well, she brought it out, and straight away I knew what it was. I said, that's not a rank. It's a, it's, a, it's a pukuro. It's used for squeezing out the tutu juice. The, the berries are very, very toxic, and you have to know your seasons when we together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, then it's squeezed out, and then um, the juice and it's a certain time of the year, the juice is strained through this pukoro. That's why it's such a fine weave. But here's a closer shot. Now, the weave is, a, is, is what we call here, the weave construction. I said, why did you call it a rag? And she said, it's because that's what Augustus Hamilton called it, was a rag. What? And I suppose it would have been a rag to him uh, at, at the time. But what he failed to see was the construction of this pukuru that allowed the, the kete to be squeezed tightly and then it would bounce back to its original size. And there's the, the change as you can see here. 
And that's called the Taki Tori Weave. So we'll just go back. So that, that's the Takatutu that's standing up. And you can see on this one the chains over there. And then it was also a mocha braid that was, and it's, by the way, it's, uh, this is uh, rubbed with koko wai to keep it strong. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, 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 a type of mud, uh, a red mud that, if you're talking about red like mud that we use, it's called koko wai. And, here it is, so you're seeing this at, you know, at microscopic level, but there's my attempt. And you can see my fingers and how wide the strings were, the ear, ear. So I'm going to finish off with, uh, this is my second to last slide, but it was very difficult to do, you know, because when I was doing my PhD, they said, oh, you're going to make a kaitaka or a kaitaka. I said, no, I'm going to bring back the voice of the unknown weaver. And they said, what do you mean by that? And I said, because I feel that when something is being called a rag and no one knows the construction of it or the material, then that's more important to me right now. And so I decided that then, that if I was ever to do a PhD, it would be about the kūkuro. And because it was kept in the dark, when I had my exhibition, I kept this in the dark, and then as you walked in, it had a trip light that brought it, brought it up. So, um, yeah, I didn't want to take too much time up, because I know you've had the, probably only got about 20 minutes of question time. <laughs> And um, I just once again like to acknowledge, so that's what my PhD was about, uh, what we already know, what we need to gain more of, and what we need to share, and for those weavers out there, or for anyone who wants to replicate, look at our artefacts. I, and I pinch myself now because I, we worked in the education background for a long time, and now I'm a uh, how I'd like to curate an at the Auckland Museum and I want to acknowledge the support they've given me being here too. Um, and I'm, I'm really enjoying being and working in the museum and with our time. Ngamhi kia kata kato. chicken skin. I don't know about you guys, but yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for um, for both of your talks and the ways that they um, both described how knowledge is, is hidden in many respects from us within museums. Um, and that it took both of you in, in your own ways to kind of release with your voice to this knowledge that that is that exists that is too often hidden 
Um, so I guess before we open it up for questions, um, and because the Institute is very much, it, we have here 17 people, um, indigenous folks working in museums, and it's often contested territory, you know? So I guess I'm wondering um, how you feel working you know, uh, what what is your relationship, I guess, to to museums, and has it evolved or changed over time? Yeah. And, and maybe I can take this, please. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, being in the museums for, God, in reality, nearly 30 years. And I'll share with you, um, when I first came into museums, I learned the practice of conservation. Everything needed to be flat. If I saw a fold, it had to be flat. If I saw something crease, it had to be humidified and weighted and creased. If I saw a cloak being used for repatriation, it was a no-no. It was like, oh my God, they haven't even got gloves on. Mm -hmm. um, and so I separated myself from that um, because it wasn't in keeping of this practice conservation that I had learned. Mm -hmm. However, I was also totally mindful of that there was a disconnection between the town and the people that desperately needed to be connected to them. Who was I? To say, even though it was within the museum practice, this empir empirical sort of institution mm -hmm. that says that something is going to last forever if you um, handle it with gloves on, if you don't move it, if there's no point of connection with the people, I can't. I've learned that it doesn't actually function or it isn't for the people. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, I, 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 with taking, having, having left the, the museum world, but still practicing conservation, uh, my weaver's hat has come more, uh, more solid on my head. And, uh, but the other thing is being Māori, being Indigenous, and being a woman, um, I'm so proud of our technology. Um, and so I want that to be known, and I don't want to have any see any disconnection. Certainly, that I don't want to be any part of the disconnection. Um, I want to extrapolate as much as I can. My, you know, this, we, Carl and I have actually realised, my gosh, you know what we've been brought up with. Uh, we are so privileged. Uh, we know this, um, and and it's because of our bucket bumper that that we know that we've been exposed to this. And yet, like Kahu said, some of the other people haven't been. Um, and there's, there's no need for me to advocate or direct or say to anybody else, you shouldn't touch or you shouldn't be involved because, you know, the conservation practices is that, you know, everything's got to look smart and it's got to stay there. If it's too fragile, don't pull it out. Uh, well, it, that page is turned for me. <laughs> if it's fragile, there'd be more reason for you to see it. I think in our collection stores, we need to have these uh, tāonga that are uh, more exposed so that you can be with them. That kōrawai that I absolutely would love to treat. Um, it hasn't had enough exposure because of the fragmentation of the dyed black fibre. Uh, because it is a serious issue, because there is black dust all over the place, and it's pretty scary. But you can, we must find ways in, in conservation. So. All I'm saying really is that conservation needs to have a sort of a bring closer the practitioner, uh, the people, um, close the gap. Uh, it's a political term used some time ago, actually. I think that can apply to the museum. So, yeah, I, 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 I still am a conservator, uh, but I'm a conservator slash weaver, practitioner, to do Māori. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, working in museums, I've only worked in museums for uh, uh, the Auckland Museum for two, just over two years now. And like I said, I've come from an education background. 
I think we need to one, we need to do, have a lot more practical uh, workshops, and I'm really glad, oops, really, um, yeah, I feel positive about uh, a way forward. It, you know, I'm happy that I'm where I'm at right now, because I I've always wanted to get into work in the museum so that I could be close to the Tonga as much as I could. So it's it's my job, but it's also a place where I want to be. I've I've done my years of teaching of, of, of this knowledge that I've shown you as much as I can. What I don't like about what's going on with um, our Mato Ranga, it's been converted into uh, levels of learning that are not of our own. It's an education system that is not of our own. Um, so that's why I feel we have to have more one and uh, working museums will um, with Tonga will help us see more about what our tūpuna have left us. Um, but of course I feel privileged being in the museum and what we want to do and uh, you know what we hope to do is open up the uh, storage uh, the Tonga to a lot more of our communities so that they can connect with their Tonga mm -hmm. so that they can come and see their stories so that they can be grieved by their own tūpuna that they have been, you know, suppressed about and, and, you know, and removed. So that's what I feel about working in the museum. It's a two-way thing. Yeah. Any questions out there? Um, you know, you touched lightly on, you touched lightly on, on the use of um, gloves when handling um, the older pieces, you know, something that we're learning in the program from some institutions here is that sometimes when we use gloves, it, it might even work against us or work to damage like paper, for example, or older materials. And so I was wondering when you're working with more items, if, if you found that there are places where you do need to use gloves or, or, or other instances where you, you're working with your hands or other tools. So just through your experience, um, okay. uh, you... <coughs> uh, well, if I'm understanding it, um, that you know, the question is, is that if I can explain situations where I wear gloves and where I don't wear yeah, gloves. Or, yeah, or are there instances where you, you just work with your hands? Um, and I know they're just such, they're older items, historic items, but do you find that sometimes it's better to just work with your hand as opposed to putting on gloves because it might be, it might work to damage the items that you're right. holding? Yeah. Or maybe there's a specific type of glove or different kinds of gloves you use when, when touching different objects? Yeah. Okay, so uh, in conservation, uh, you know, we have to work quite finely, and actually with textiles, there's a lot of sort of intricacies, there's a whole lot of different elements that are crossing over. So, for example, when I worked on the Aungola, Colonial Office Aungola, which I'm, I'm, I was very privileged to, um, uh, two of us were working together to uh, attach uh, mm -hmm. a linen fabric as a support to the Aungola. Uh, so, um, to position the needle uh, between elements without piercing an element, it's actually <laughs> impractical to do it with a glove on. Um, so what that means is that we have to wash our hands, which is why I end up with quite dry hands. Um, but continual washing and trying not to touch the surface of any elements that are that said, though, we had to separate feathers to receive the needle that was coming up from the bottom and then keep the uh, feathers away to place then the needle to go back down to the received under it. So it just, you know, when you, when you have, unless you have skin-tight gloves, 
uh, and which uh, cause your hands to sweat quite quite badly. Then you can only your your work uh, time or practice is quite challenging, uh, and, it's, and it's over very short distances, which in some cases you have to, have to do. So. What I'm saying is that there, there are times when you have to wear gloves, but sometimes where it's absolutely impractical to wear gloves. So lots of washing hands. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, people outside of the museum uh, that want to, cannot just touch with their eyes, but have to have a contact. You know that even when, amongst us as humans, we have to uh, do the touch. It's the same thing for for Tonga. For if I, you know, if I was to see a, um, oh well, I've had all these privileges, but I can so understand. And some people come into the collection store, that's, you know, to make that connect. And it's just even if you touch a fibre, there's something that they've done that they've connected themselves to that, and it isn't through a piece of plastic. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I think touch. As, as controllable, um, it's sometimes necessary, but you know, we've got to manage it um, and let some things happen. You know, if, if a fibre is lost because someone touched it, it's one fibre and a gazillion fibres. If one feather should fall, uh, then it's one, one feather, but someone's been touched, someone's connected. Uh, is it sacrificial? Probably. But we can sit around for ages and say, no feather is going to fall with that, and then no one will be connected. Can I just uh, extend that question? Is um, because our low hollow mats, the older they are, um, when we walk on them with our feet, we load only them with our, with our oils. Uh -huh. So the oil actually helps in the um, preservation. So is there any discussion of the nature of oils as a positive? Um, addition to touching up on? Um, I don't know, but that's a very good research project. I think it probably could. Um, yeah, the nature of the oil, we've always been taught in conservation that, is, that it is acidic. Um, but you know, we have to weigh the nature of soiling up. Uh, so. Uh, it, it could be because you can actually de develop that handling to build a patina, which actually could then uh, lead to some sort of sort of uh, protection coating, if you like. Um, it's a bit far stretched, but I think it, uh, the chemistry of it, uh, I guess, in, the, in one sense, you know, with being in the museum, it initiates all of these conversations and certainly this research. Um, I, I was always taught that you know that that, that, that the oils from my hands hands are very acidic. Uh, but yeah, going back to whether it's going to enable or disable somebody to be reconnected. I don't know. Actually, I'd like to answer to a question. Is, uh, I, there's another way of answering it too, and in, in, in a slight way, I think. Now, our mother always said. You can't conserve them something forever and ever and ever. The only way to conserve is to teach and to continue on that way. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, that's why we're doing both. You know? So the more that our people become interested in our, align ourselves with, with what our tupuna have left, and I'm not just talking about women, but everything that's done. Um, that helps conserve the knowledge and the, and the artifacts to just continue on. Yes, I wanted to ask, uh, thank you very much. Have you ever in your years of studying your the weaving that you've come across something in another museum perhaps, or something that you've seen that's extraordinary or unusual in the weaving world that would make you question or think about or go back to the grassroots level of what you what you know and what you've learned throughout your years of weaving. So the question is, have we ever seen anything uh, that worked unusual in other museums and have taken us back to what we learned? 
Yes, today. <laughs> <laughs> no, at the Bishop Museum today, we saw some cloaks that it was amazing. But, you know, I've seen some over in England and, uh, and the States. Um, Ronnie's probably seen a lot more than I have. Um, but it takes us back to that place because of our knowing. And we know what work went into it. But we also want to go beyond what we see. And then, you know, with, with that sort of, you should have seen us today, analysing every little stitch. And we were looking at Tarangi Hilo's cloak today. It was just amazing. And so we have this certain talk or this banter between ourselves. And I'm sure even at home we, we tend to do that. And yeah, I think the other sisters, they get a bit lost on, on, on what we we're talking about. But we can understand each other. And um, Marcus and Kamaru, who were with us today, showing us these uh, artifacts of these kākaru, these certain stitches that we've seen in, in the coloration. It's, um, you know, brings to light, and, and Rangi said it today, we're going to be doing this for the rest of our lives, and we have to just keep on passing it on, and I can't emphasise that enough, because I don't think we're going to live long enough to know what else is out there. It's, it's that... Te aho mutunga kore, the everlasting thread, it will never cease. Mm. Yeah, so the, the, I can just, I'll just carry on a little bit like that. Um, I, I saw this, this, this kākaha and I was wowed by it. <clears throat> and so I've got, you know, whilst my main subject in the conservation of Māori textiles has been black, um, <laughs> it's now red. I'm not so the red, red brown. So red, as we all know, is quite significant. Um, it's representation. So the cloak that I saw today, um, for me, is screaming red. Um, and I haven't seen anything as red brown as that. Uh, not that coat. Um, and it, the lot, you know, it's one of the Rangi Hero's uh, cloaks. So I was very, very excited about that. Um, and, you know, my eyes have become attuned to, to this red brown. I'm very excited about that. And I want to develop it. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I saw that, so my challenge now is if I see anything like that, I've got to go and replicate it. I'm going to try and make, make another sample of it. Yeah. But, you know, on, on all of that, should I do that? When I, when I do that, I've got to go and harvest the ha uh, tamikaha. Then the brother of tamikaha is toa I've got to harvest toa toa. Where does that, what is the land <coughs> for toa toa? What, 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 what ground does it like? What fenua does it like to grow on? Um, I've got to study the pot that, that, that it wants to be dyed in to procure this colour. So that is a connectivity with my environment. But in doing so, uh, any practitioner or any weaver that wants to get out there is being, not only being connected, I think I'm probably repeating myself here, not only connected to the, to, the, to the land, to the forest and all that, but that's absolutely relative to where we are today as human beings. Because it's all relative to the quality of your water and your your health is dependent on the water. Am I telling you anything? Probably not. Uh, but but just some basic practices that our ancestors did were relative to your health. If you looked after the trees, they looked after the water, the water looked after them. Very simple. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. advocate for that mm -hmm. practices. We do have a question that came in from um, from out in virtual land, um, and actually it has to do with um, the past use of toxic materials to preserve artifacts in museums and how that perhaps influences this issue of whether you wear or not wear gloves, right, which I guess entails having to have a strong knowledge of what happened or how these tongs were, were, were treated or have been treated in museums. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, a good practice uh, prior to carrying out any conservation is not only 
knowing the material composition of which practitioners like myself and co can actually support or give information to. Um, but, uh, um, you know, the identifying uh, substances are on the material, like using the XRF um, elemental analysis, that'll detect any sort of arsenogenic uh, uh, matter on there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if uh, there's some history, that, in, in the best of cases, there's some history that comes with, uh, with the Tonga on its record. Label that you all was collected by this uh, person, and sometimes you can piece together whether it was actually treated, pending the period of time that it was acquired, whether it was treated with um, toxic materials to keep the insects or the bugs off. Mm. So it's a good precautionary, a good practice to actually use some sort of elemental analysis to identify that prior to handling. And if it is there, then certainly it's isolated, and that is the situation. It's for total health reasons that you do have to wear gloves. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, Kahu, I, I know that you brought some books with you. I don't know if you brought one with you, but did you want to? Did you want to say something about the publication? Oh, I think it's sweet. Um, I did bring uh, some books with me. And it's called Inga Uri Whakatipu. It's all about uh, the, the an exhibition we had back in 2015-16 at Waikato Museum, and uh, it's just showing it's showing all the different plates that are that are in our um, Takano Ahetit collection at the Waikato Museum, and it also um, tells about the story of from the seven generations right now. To today on how we've been able to preserve it. So um, I've got those books with me. Sorry, I never bought them. And I think a few of them are um, arts and letters in downtown Honolulu, mm -hmm. if anybody's interested. Um, so this brings us to a close. Um, I just have a... a, a yes, go ahead. Um, was there ever a, a time that you might have come across energies that made you feel that? So, how did you go that? So, I'm sorry, let me just repeat the question, which is, uh, or do you want to, uh, you can repeat the question. Okay, so the question is, um, 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 the, the question is in, in relation to having felt energy from the Taonga. Um, while working on it, that may have caused you to do something, to reach out to others, other practitioners? How, how would you have gone about it? Okay. What, what was it involved mm. in order to accomplish the work that was at hand? There was one instance. There's been two incidences. Uh, I don't usually share them, but, but you've asked. Mm -hmm. You'll be the first one that's asked, mm -hmm. so I must reply. I had an incident, and I was not long into conservation. Um, I had, and I can't actually name anything here, uh, but there were two kākahu that were brought into for treatment. Um, one of them was supposed to belong to, or did belong to this person, this of significant mana. Um, but the label was incorrect, um, and I began treating the kākahu, which I thought was the, the significant cloak. And I completed the treatment, and I thought, oh, well, that's all good. And I went on to the next one, and I was soon made aware that this is the significant cloak. So I'll describe as best I could what 
brought me still was that I couldn't move. As I approached the kākahu, uh, you know, very sort of, not blasé, but, you know, the normal action towards going to reveal the kākahu, I, uh, one step in front of the other, and then I realised something's happening, and that happening was a not happening. I couldn't move. I couldn't move. I, I was paralysed. And um, I knew over, uh, <laughs> over me um, that something had taken part of my energy um, and I was uh, dumbfounded. Now, we're only talking sort of seconds, uh, but it was enough to make me stop. I withdrew and I thought very seriously. I knew I'd had an experience of some sort and I, you know, I pulled the indigenous nature of me out and thought, um, screamed around the corner and said, a cut here. Okay. And then from that on, uh, time onwards, I never approached it until I had got a blessing of the whole conservation lab, a blessing of me, um, and by the faith that was relative to the kākahu that had come in front of me. <coughs> so that's that occasion. And then one other occasion, I could feel the energy from a kākahu and I decided not to go there. And that was completely <coughs> out of the museum. Um, it wasn't a collection, but not in the museum. Oh, not so much in the museum presence. Was that after the first After. after. Yeah, so I was sort of... I sort of, I was familiar with it. But very interesting question. Never been asked before. Thank you. When you had um, the blessing of the lab, was that something that you did personally or you engaged with others to help? I engaged with the minister, the appropriate minister. He blessed me, the lab, my car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, as it is, uh, from that day on, um, I've had three or four encounters with this cargo and we're mates now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's all good. It's all good. But so so there is there is that to happen. Um, and yes, they do have a, there is a spirit, there's no doubt about that. And I think that was learnt with the great Tamari exhibition, although a lot of people don't sort of the museum world doesn't really sort of uh, acknowledge it so much. Uh, you know, there are things like um, the time of that left New Zealand to go over to America. Um, they were all scheduled to go at a certain time. Uh, time was supposed to go on certain flights out, and that all changed. Um, it all it all changed, uh, and that's another story. Though. Yeah, things they I think they have. Yeah. The By the way, they didn't have weaving when they were
Kota nga kapin mo, dyan po eh. Ah. Kapo tayo, iro tayo tako pa si man naman. Tayo tayo pakubaya ka. E pa na kinaman. Kiko kurwa sa katawin. Kiko yung may tingin. Ah, minamahi ka. Minamahi ya. Apilihia eh, kore. Ah, ah, koi ga, koi ga nwa na apilihia tsika. Ta koto kito fana. Mahalo na hiraka for that. Um, just a, a few things that I wanted to mention because um, uh, Rani mentioned the Kalania Pu'u cloak um, as part of her response. We do have a talk that is going to be held at Bishop Museum next Thursday, um, on July 27th, I'm sorry, next Wednesday, 7.27, um, from 6 to 7.30. Um, that also will be um, live on um, actually Bishop Museum's YouTube channel. So if you can't make it in person, um, Please do um, follow that up. There, you can find that event listed on Bishop Museum's website. <coughs> the one thing I will add about that is that the talk will be given in Hawaiian Hall in the presence of Kalania Pu'u's Mea Vai Vai Ali'i, both his Mahiole and the Ahu'ula that I think uh, Agi, more than anybody else alive, has spent more time in the presence of that ahu'ula than anybody else cleaning cleaning his feathers getting him ready for his homecoming mm -hmm. um so uh, again what a wonderful opportunity to hear you talk about that process and that experience in his presence um the second thing i want to mention is that um our, our cohort has been hard at work and our, um, our institute, our in-person institute will culminate in an exhibition that's going up right now. And it will open to the public on July 31st, which is a Sunday. Is it noon that it, the opening? Is it? <laughs> anyway, yes. Yeah. 2 p.m. Sorry, 2 p.m. So I would invite you all um, to come back, uh, to come and um, see the this wonderful exhibition, which um, all of our cohort members hand carry things from home, uh, uh, items, objects that um, tell of their connection to people and place and to each other. So uh, please do. I hope we see you July 31st. And again, if we can give give our wonderful speakers um, a pa'i pa'i lima for a wonderful <laughs> And please stay for food. We have lots of food. Dim sum.